Well, welcome to Sunday Night Live, also known as the Lovecraft Easy Podcast. Uh, hopefully, you're watching us on Facebook um, or YouTube, of course. If you're watching us on either one, let, let us know that you can see us. That would be really, really uh, helpful for me. Um, or, I mean, on, on uh, YouTube. It's not come up on YouTube. And let, let it us just know that did. you can see us. Did. That would be really... It's not come up on YouTube yet? It, it just did. Oh, okay. All right. All right, so again, welcome to the Lovecraft Easy Podcast. Um, are we up on YouTube, Logan? I think we are. Uh, all right, no, I'm actually not on YouTube, on Facebook. Yeah, so we're live on Facebook. Okay, all right. Again, welcome. All right, we've got several topics. We're going we're gonna to talk about the scariest novels we've ever read and a few more things, give some shout outs to... Uh, books that came out in 2021, 2022, and our, and or our upcoming in 2022. Um, so, so I got to tell you this, I got, and Logan knows I'm going to tell this story. So a couple of hours ago, my wife says to me, she goes, uh, Mike, I'm a nerd like you. I'm watching a time travel show. I'm like, okay, uh, is this a romantic time travel show? And she's like, yeah. It's called Ordinary Joe, I guess. Yeah, well, there's a difference between time travel and romance time travel, because there's a lot of romantic time travel novels. But the really funny part of this story is my son goes in there and watches an episode or two, and I think he wants to throw a brick at the TV. I, I, I Right, Logan? I don't know what your problem was with that. but It's an understatement. <laughs> time travel That's... movie, though, it's kind of more like an alternate universe movie. Oh, you've seen it? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I was like, Logan, you know what? It, how it is with mom's TV programs. And he goes, I'd rather watch the reality TV show so that she watches. So anyway, Ordinary Joe, I'm going to avoid it. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, click like. It helps us a lot. Comment. Um, and if you're wherever you if you watch or listen to this show, if you go to iTunes and leave us a, uh, a review, it helps out a lot, the algorithm. Uh, apparently, a lot of people go through iTunes as compared to other channels. Uh, why don't we do introductions and then chat? I'm Mike Davis, Lovecraft Zine. Pete. Um, Pete Rollick, uh, General's, General Dog's Body. What? Dog's Body. That's an archaic term. <laughs> it is. Oh, my wife is watching. Be careful. Okay. Uh, Rick. Do Rick you... Lay, writer and pulp magazine collector. Do you write books too, Pete? I write crappy books. Well, your newest book is the Miskatonic uh, University Spiritualism Club. Right. right. Musk. It's a, mouth, it's a mouthful. Musk. Yes. And it's but, available on Amazon and where? Uh, at the publisher, um, Jack and Apes Press. Okay. Well, I've got it linked to in the in the show notes, wherever you're watching. Um, all right. Rick, I want to talk about you guys' books a little bit. What's your latest stories or books or whatever? Um, I wrote a short story for uh, Collecting Cool Tales of the Shadowman. Uh, called The Prisoner of Cannes, Cagliostro, which is a mystery, um, somewhat sci-fi horror story. Well, if you like, you know, pulp type of fiction, um, all that stuff. It's more Victorian. Escape uh, it's more in the Sherlock Holmes, Robert Louis Stevenson line. Okay, good. No, I speak it in general. Just go to uh, ricklay.com. It'll take you to his Amazon page. Go ahead, Rick. Sorry. I finished. Oh, all right. Um, Matt. Hi there. I'm Matt. I do have a prize today. Just finished it. It's by Larry Correa. Um, it's called The Monster Hunters. It's his first three Monster Hunter novels in an omnibus book, so it's huge. Holy cow. Um, it's kind of military sci-fi monster killing. There's Lovecraftian shout-outs, but it's 
not really Lovecraftian at all. It's more like high gear and macho shooting up monsters. If you want to win it, um, send an email to ezineprizes at gmail.com and put monster in the subject heading. We'll draw a winning in about, uh, winner in about six weeks, and it could be you. Hey, we're, we're working on this Facebook thing, and I think um, we got past all of our glitches today. I think uh, people are watching on Facebook, but I have too many screens in front of me. Give me a shout out if you are watching on Facebook. Ben, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Ben. Um, so first, we want to point out, Mike That'll, says he doesn't that's watch. That's enough. That's enough. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, you know, I bet if I ask Danielle how many seasons of Outlander you've watched, what kind of answer am I going to get? Zero. Throw that out there. And uh, the the prize that Matt's offering, I just want to say, it's also um, it's sort of like action comedy. So if you're into that, my I know my 12 year old or my son when he was 12, those were the only books we could get him to read, and he read them about eight times. So highly recommended. I haven't watched Outlander. I don't know what you're trying to accuse me of. We all know you're a closet fan, Mike. You can't hide it. <sighs> Last but not le uh, least, Bridget. Well, today I am not only a final girl, but I am the final girl <laughs> introductions. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get, uh, I'm gonna get angry letters. Oh, the, you saved the woman to the last, huh? No, that's fine. <laughs> Isn't that like uh, he's the strongest of us all? True. Sure. That's true. All right. You didn't yes. introduce yourself. You no, <laughs> now, now I can get a word in. Hi, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bridget. I uh, create music and art things. Uh, what's your website address? Oh, BridgetHashburnMark.com. All right. So um, let me see. Why don't we mention Melissa's book? Oh, well, first of all, who's who was foolish enough? I apparently, according to Mike DeBronzo, Feria, the darkest light is a dud. I watched the first episode and no more. I watched I, three and, and went and stopped. What I watched that? the whole thing. I watched a half episode of the first one and stopped. So DeBronzo and DeBronzo's, uh, he, he, Mike DeBronzo's wife is mad at him for <laughs> having to watch it. So what did you think, Pete? I, I think I want my six episodes back. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was, did not live it, up to the hype. No. In, in fact, all right. So here's the funny thing. One of my favorite shows of the, la of the pandemic is um, Money Heist. Ordinary Joe. No, Money Heist, <laughs> which is this Spanish uh, production um where a bunch of guys steal money from like the Spanish treasury and stuff like that. But it has all the same voice actors as Feria. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so I like, I, we know I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, Feria was kind of, I mean, <clears throat> there was, there was some interesting opportunities there. But missed opportunities. Yeah. I mean look, the the big bad potential. the big bad for most of the of the of the series was this was a cat. I didn't get that far, I guess. Yeah. Me either. It was a cute little cat, and I get it, but you know, it did it just didn't work. Um, anyway, yeah, it's like it could almost have been like a cat of Ulthar or a, a cat of Saturn, um, but it just didn't pan out. And all right, I'm gonna just say this because it's it's <laughs> there was a lot of TNA. That, Feria, uh, yeah, it didn't seem warranted. Yeah, exactly. It's like why does everybody have to be naked? I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And why do they all have to be in their seventies? <laughs> um, <laughs> that was the first episode. That's what they stopped watching. Yeah, it, it just did. It there was no. Um, there was no reason for that. It was gratuitous, and yeah, it just didn't make any sense. It's like and it's I, not a real ritual unless you're naked, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, and and like later on, there's a couple episodes 
where they're involving the younger people and they're trying to convert the 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 the, the girls. Oh, and okay. but so, you so never you're telling me this is just like dreams from the witch house that we just saw in pro in uh, Portland. Yeah, it actually is worse, but yeah, oh, God, it can't be. Well, there were yeah. two two Netflix episodes that looked uh, very promising when it came to Lovecraftian themes, cosmic horror themes. One of them was Archive 81, and one of them was Fury of the Darkest Light. And Archive 81 came Delivered. through as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Yes. But I couldn't get through Fury either. No. And I only watched it. I basically watched it all in one night. And, you know, it could have been a hell of a lot shorter and had the same or if not more impact. What so, movie that I, Logan, what movie did I recommend to you and your friends? You've talking about It Follows because that's a great movie. I don't care what you say. <sighs> he's, he's chatting on the sidebar. I am talking about It Follows. He's running me down on the sidebar. So, so do you want me to tell this story? No, no. Oh, yeah, no that's working. what I thought. He's afraid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not, I just don't know what you will what you'll actually say. Uh, all right. Melissa could not be here today. Unfortunately, she's working. So here's her list of creepiest novels: The Croning by Laird Barron, um, The Cipher by Kathy Koja, Haunting of Hill House, Shirley Jackson, and she says pretty much every story in Painted Devils by uh by aikman. robert aikman yeah robert aikman yeah so i wanted to mention hers first now i know that and i'm getting hungrier as i say this but i know that pete has to go after an hour to eat fish that he caught himself so let's start Second with ass. you pete i know yeah um okay so so i know um Matt does not like Graham Masterton, but there is a scene in um, Graham Masterton's Tengu, which just totally freaks me out. And it involves uh, torture and barbed wire and it always creeps me out. Um, so, yeah, Tengu by Graham Masterton. Um, I, and I'm going to do some dark horses here. Okay. Um, China Meville's Perdido Street Station. It's billed as like a, a fantasy sci fi thing, but there oh, are some you real got great. to be kidding me. What? Let uh, him finish. Maybe it scared him. I didn't know, but there is some creepy stuff in there. It's like, because one, what's there's all these narratives going along. But then there's a sort of like these things that everybody's seeing and nobody understands is that like all the machines in the city, all like the vacuum cleaners are becoming self-aware. And nobody really knows that's going on. What you do not want is a self-aware vacuum cleaner. No. <clears throat> and then like they're dealing with this supernatural menace that's invading the city. So they go to go to get help and the mayor goes to the um, embassy for hell and says, hey, look, you know, um, we've got this thing in our city. We were wondering if you could help us out. And the ambassador from hell was like, um, no, we're leaving. And they close the embassy of hell because they don't want anything to do with the supernatural event. So I, I kind of like that creeps me out a little bit. So I got to tell you, the monster that you're talking about is the dream the, moth, the, the slake moth, right? Yes. It, it's 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 a very cool creation. But to get through it, you have to go with the fact that everybody in the city is really stupid. Yes. And then one thing that really bugs me is his self-righteousness. <laughs> so the main character is uh trying to create wings for some flying creature that lost its wings and so there's a lot of stuff about flying but then he finds out that the crime he lost his wings for was that of rape right and he says i'm not going to do this for you but 
he's perfectly willing to take an old guy with cancer and say, well, you can die while I trap the snake, the slake moth. It's like, I don't understand any of that, but you're really talking me out of reading this. <laughs> it, it drove me the frick. Like, it's okay that I can be all high and mighty, and then I'm going to take an old guy who probably needs hospice and pain medicines and put him out here where these things can eat him. Okay, sidebar. Can we... <coughs> ben, I don't know if it's you encouraging my son or my son encouraging you, but you guys are... I don't know. You're all right. Go ahead, Pete. All right. So, oh, and I'm just wondering. I got to say this, but we do. DeBronzo, are you off the couch yet for having, making your watch your wife watch Furia: The Darkest Light? Go ahead, Pete. All right. So, the next two are both from Neil Gaiman. Coraline, mm. which just creeps me the hell out, and the graveyard, the graveyard book. Those are book, really, yeah, they're both you know great horror stories, but they deal with kids. And yeah. you know, I mean, the opening of the graveyard book is you know, the, the kid's family being slaughtered by Jack the Ripper and him escaping into a graveyard like Mowgli in the Jungle Book, except he's raised by the undead. And it that's just creepy to me. Yeah. Okay. I'll go with that. Um, it just wigs me the, the hell out. And then finally, this is a, a short story, so it's not a novel. But George R. R. Martin, Sand Kings. I don't think I've read that. So Sand Kings about is about this guy who he's a collector he's got to have the best things that ever you know the best of everything and he goes to an exotic alien pet store i'm watching you i'm watching you man he goes to this exotic alien pet store and he gets like alien ants except they're you know they're big um like uh like cat size and he gets he has to have a giant uh the cage installed and he has two separate um, tribes of them and he feeds them and over the course of the storyline they build their castles with his image on their castle so they recognize him that recognize that they he feeds them and they take he takes care of them and that they're he is essentially their god but then he starts like wanting them to fight so he cuts off their food supply and he destroys their castles and he, you know he he makes them fight so they keep rebuilding it but then his image changes it becomes more malicious so he starts becoming a benign god he starts becoming a malevolent god it just gets worse from there He's trying his hand at Gnosticism, you know. Yeah. So anyway, those are those are some of my top creepy novels. And you know, I'll, I'll just throw in um, Pet Cemetery is just something I can't read again. Mm -hmm. I 100 percent agree. I I love my pets and my my kids, and you know, honestly, it still freaks me out. IT, it, Stephen King's it. So, yeah, that bothers me too. I just want to throw out uh, The Sand Kings was actually made into an Outer Limits episode in the yes, 90s. Yes, it was. Um, it's not as good as the short story. The short story, the protagonist, he's not a good person. Um, and I'll, I'll end it there. Whereas the, the TV show tries to give you someone to cheer for. Um, yeah. But it was made into an Outer Limits episode. And it was it was pretty good Outer Limits. It, it captured everything. Um. The other thing that I'll mention is a, is a sci-fi novel by uh, Greg Bear called Blood Music, which is also made into, I believe, an Outer Limits episode. Um, it's about a guy who uh, is working on nanite technology and injects it into himself. And it's originally a short story, but it was expanded into a novel. And he, uh, he breaks down into a Shagoth-like creature and slowly takes over the world. Hmm. So anyway, those are my good my good novels. When you mentioned uh, ants the size of cats, 
Yeah. I'm 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 going through the Charlie Parker uh detective series again. You know, it's de- detective series and yeah. it's got paranormal in it. Um by John Connolly. In, in the third book, which I'm on right now, The Killing Kind, uh this lady is killed by this really horrible guy. She's taped inside her car to the f- front seat and he releases tarantulas all through the car in through her mouth tapes her mouth shut and then puts brown recluse spiders in the car for the police to find so yeah that's gross yeah yeah that's not exactly what i was talking about but it's still really freaky yep yeah bridget you want to go Oh, gosh, sure. So at first, when you said, oh, we're going to talk about our creepiest stories. Um, so my dra- my brain was down like a different path. And then yeah, you said, yeah, no, I'm the scariest. And I'm like, OK, so you're just going to get a both <laughs> or, or both. Yeah. Sorry, no, sorry. Because um, <clears throat> at first when you said creepiest, I was thinking, OK, well, usually a lot of times when I read horror, it doesn't necessarily um, creep me out because it's more fantasy to me. In a lot of ways, yeah. but the ones that that really creep me out um, that came to mind is actually Needful Things when I read it was really creepy to me because it wasn't so much about the super ma- supernatural or, you know, religious forces at play in the story. It was about what the people were willing to do to get what they wanted. That creeped me out a lot reading that. Yeah. Um, and then also the um, it's actually a young adult novel by Francis Harbinge, but it's uh, it's called. Um, oh, shoot. Now I got to pull it up again. Um, there's a couple of them by her that are really creepy to me. Um, and I should have written them down because I was looking well, at while them, you're but... while you're pulling them up. Let me just say, yeah, you're right. I said creepy and then I said scary because I wasn't sure. I <laughs> <laughs> if I was communicating, I'm talking about, you know, you're reading a passage in a book yeah, and all of a sudden you look around and make sure the doors are locked things, you know, cause it's just so such a scary slash creepy effect. And I don't know, some people, the word creepy and the word scary, it means different things to different people. And it can be in some, to some people interchangeable, yeah. I guess. So. so, okay. So I found it. Sorry. So there's actually two of them uh, and they're, <laughs> Yeah, they're young adult novels, but uh, one is called A Face Like Glass, and it creeped me out because it was just so imaginative and a different kind of place sort of way. It was, in a way, kind of like Coraline or, you know, really Im- imaginative Tim Burton kind of alternate place, and it's about a girl who lives underground with this society. Um and she does such a great job of making you not know like how, what size are these people? I mean, you could be talking about little teeny tiny creatures under the ground. You're not sure, but they don't have faces and she's the only, so they wear masks to show their different emotions. And then she has a face though, but nobody wants to see it. It's kind of like that Twilight Zone episode, you know, beauty is an eye beholder a little bit. But it just, there wasn't anything that was particularly scary about it, but it creeped me out just because of how otherworldly it seemed in the way she wrote it. And um, it was so interesting to me. And then there's another book by her called A Skin Full of Shadows that creeped me out because it's about a girl who inherits from her family the ability to have uh, people possess her. But uh, it's this. Who's this author again? I'm sorry. Um, Francis Harbinge. Okay. And what is so cool about that is that she take you know the, she comes across these ghosts and then they're able to possess her. It's kind of like she collects them, and they become alternate personalities of her. And it's more of an adventure story than a horror story, but it was just the concept and the way that she describes it in the book was so creepy to me of just, okay, well now I need, I need to call upon this bear spirit, or I need to call upon this other ghost that I met from this different time period to, to possess me. 
and the fact that it ran in her family it was just super creepy to me <laughs> yeah and a lot of these when you're That's what I asked, how old were you when you read those um i was um in my 40s <laughs> It wasn't actually that long ago. Still creeped me out. So, you know, I found that you can explain something. You can explain to people about a passage that creeps you out. Like I know I'll do this with my list, and they're they're like, uh, that doesn't sound very scary. But if you if you're in the experience of reading the book with your imagination at work, that's a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. Sort of that you have to be there. To yeah. Get it's- it. It's kind of funny because, yeah, I was reading these young adult, adult novels and I was in my 40s and I was like, wow, that really creeped me out. And then I was just talking about Stephen King's Needless Thing, which I read things which I read when I was probably 14. You know? So you're <laughs> reading the young adult scary books <laughs> in your 40s. And yeah. Yeah. You know, 14 years old. I got to detox a little, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so, OK, so uh, any more? Oh, uh, gosh. OK, so I'm trying to think of like the absolute scariest book that I ever read and I think um yeah I agree with Pete it was really scary um and it's one that you you keep thinking about later that is just really scary about it um but as far as just like absolutely like out and out terrified me I honestly can't think of one so challenge out there (laughs) guess so Bill's here. Hey, Bill. Hey, guys, Gales. Oh, I, I should I should have asked Bridget. Was that your final? Oh, for no. now, yeah. For now, okay. Bill, um, I wanted to get everybody's work out there. Um, we did this earlier. What have you written lately that you'd like to people to go to Amazon and and check out? You know, in the uh, next, well- in, like in a short version. Uh, Hellfighters is my is my new book. It's Lovecraftian. Uh, one of the reviewers said it was like if Dan Brown and, and H.P. Lovecraft had a child, which is a little misleading, but it's sort of an adventure story as, as well as Lovecraftian. And then I've got an audio book that's based on my first book. It's called More Than Evil. And it's um, it's set in a coal mining town. And these coal miners are miles underground and they release this evil that comes out and and uh, overtakes the town and threatens to spread to the wider world. Yeah, the audio book um, is really good because you you got background in all of this. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I've been a filmmaker for many years and I used all that filmmaking to do the sound design. So it's got this elaborate sound design like like in the old time radio stuff that, that, that you like. So it's it's yeah. got all kinds of music, all kinds of effects. It's, it's very, very rich. And you don't really see that a lot for horror, uh, even though horror is perfect for that for that kind of a treatment but it's just really expensive to do. And so you don't get to see it very much unless it's an old post story or something like that. Horror is perfect for that because you, yep. you, your, your, your imagination is. Yeah. Um, Bill, what's the name of that audio drama again? And, and where can people get it on audible? I think they can. Uh, yeah. Audible. That's uh, more than evil. And there's also a print version of that on Amazon fighters, okay. which is the Lovecraftian book, which is also on Amazon. All right. Sounds good. Uh, Again, since Pete has to go in a little while, why don't we talk about, uh, you guys pointed out to me before the show that we need to talk about Richard Tierney. And I think you and Matt and Rick are probably the best to talk about it. Talk about him. He just passed away. Whoever wants to jump in. uh, He lived in the Quad Cities area, uh, which is the border of Illinois and Iowa. Um, near Moline um he was he I was think, on the a, good side of the border if you he, think he was about it. I think a university professor there but he also like had a job I think he was an entomologist uh he he did he had to do some actual work involving kind of like Pete you know the natural world I don't remember exactly but his whole life he was also fascinated by archaeology and folklore and he did actually a considerable amount of traveling and I think writing about the subject so when he came to uh, weird fiction, that informed the way that he would write. So he would also include, like, especially the House of the Toad, his stomping grounds, the Quad Cities, were, were, were part of the, uh, the backdrop of the story. He is, you know, currently, if you want to say who is the uh, uh, 
most highly regarded poet of the weird, like you might say, is, is Donald Sidney Fryer still alive? Uh, he, yes. he wrote fantastical poetry, but we think of um, Anne K. Schwader currently. She's like, she was a poet laureate at Necronomicon, but Richard Tierney came before her. And a lot of his high regard came from uh, his dark poetry, his poetry of the weird and fantastic. There are certain collections that are out there available if you like it. Um, I do recommend it if you read his poetry, if you're by yourself, read it out loud. It actually works a lot better as spoken verse. Um, if you wanna say his, I, I always found his take on the mythos to be very interesting because he kind of took Durleth and flipped it on its head. That is, there wasn't good and evil. There are two groups of transcendent beings who are both bad news as far as humanity is concerned, and they were the ones competing. And so they, you have his character, Simon of Gitta. This is around Roman times. He was a warrior, um, and these are like sword and sorcery stories, but he's fighting what are essentially mythos threats. So his novel, um, The Gardens of Lucullus, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, and his novel, The Drums of Chaos, deal heavily with Simon of Gitta. And then on the flip side, he had someone working for the other side, which was John Taggart, an Earthman who was completely bitter and disillusioned and kind of wanted to hasten the end of the universe. And that's where you would like, it's very hard to find these stories. Um, the most readily available one is an old staple paperback called The Winds of Tsar. Right. But he, in his absolute crowning glory uh, work, uh, The Drums of Chaos, these two different approaches are linked and that's how the story comes together. Uh, John Taggart meets Simon of Gitta in the time of the events in the Bible. It, it's it, a. It I looks like he has it. several available on Kindle. And, well, well, um, there's a company that is now reprinting all of his work. Like you could not okay. get the Gardens of Lucillus for t love nor money. And the Drums of Chaos went out of print immediately after Mythos Books tanked. Well, these are all going to be coming back out. Uh, I forget the name of the company that's publishing them, but you will be able to read Richard Tierney's work. And I got to say, the prose isn't necessarily the best, but the cosmic concept and sweep of the Drums of Chaos just had me utterly in awe, flabbergasted by its brilliance. So, so let me ask all of you this. Um, the person in the audience who has not read any um, of his work, has not read much of his work or any of his work, where should they start? Okay, I, I, I'll have to look it up. I'm sorry, but there were the, the new book was issued, like all of his Simon of Gitta stories. And if you're kind of like into sword and sorcery or sword and sandal, um, Conan-esque kind of writing, that would be a good place to jump in. Mark of the Beast? I think it's called uh, Swords Against Caesar. Yeah, that's no, it. there it is. Yeah, and actually, it's only ninety nine cents on Kindle. Folks. It's actually sorcery against Caesar. Sorcery against Caesar. Yeah. Um. All right. So, uh, anyone else want to add to this? He was the best writer I ever saw at combining series of different writers to have them make sense. One of his Simon of Gita stories actually connects into, into Frank Herbert's Dune. Yes. By way of Brian Lumley. And it's incredible how he manufactures that connection. It's the worm of uh, Urahu, which we know as Arrakis. Yeah, that, that the sweep of his writing was really incredible. Uh, it's just, like I said, sometimes the prose was a little too pedestrian. It's hard to he, pick the house of the toad. I think, the, I think he was best with modern, I mean, it was ancient uh, characters and it is modern business writings. Uh, at least he couldn't, he, his novel got a little too uh, laden with war of the missus. Pete, do you want to add anything? No, I, you know, so I think Matt did a really, really good job of, of 
summarizing Cherney's work. A lot of people don't like House of the Toad. I, I like it. I thought it was ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, it, it tried to do stuff that hadn't been done before, which is kind of what Turney was, was doing. And you know, Turney is, you know, the 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 end game of all his stuff is kind of blasphemous. Yes. You um, have to get a, you have to get if you're a Christian, you're gonna have big problems with it. Right. So that's kind of you know it's very ambitious and and, and daring on, on his part. Um again Matt mentioned his poetry. There's some great Arkham House volumes. Um I first ran into Cherney uh, in his Chaosium volume, the scroll, the scroll of Thoth, which collected most of the Simon of Gita stories that were out there at the time. That's long out of print, and so, uh, Sorcery Against Caesar uh, includes all those stories and a few more. So there was, that would be the volume to pick up. There's one unpublished Simon of Gita novel that's going to come out. The Path oh, of the really? Dragon. I didn't know that. Do you know the yeah. name of it? Path of the Dragon was the. Uh, it might be. It might be published together with Gardens of uh, the Colors. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I put that with Glenn Rodman. I put that in between uh, the rest of you guys giving me your your scariest slash creepiest because I know that Pete has to go in what twenty five minutes or so. Yeah. Roughly. There's one last thing on here. Yes. He's responsible for coining the phrase the Durless mythos. And he played a major role in divorcing love really? class concepts from Durless. Oh, yeah. He wrote that the, wow. the, the Durless method in the HPL yeah. memoir thing. Yeah. You're right. By the, he, by he the Frearson. Intellectual. Oh, wow. Multiple that's interesting. Like yeah. a polymath. Yeah. And even though he criticized Dolitz, he maintained all of his concepts. He just did a shift on them. Right. All right. Anything else on Tierney? Um, rest in peace. I'm glad he was here. I just want to throw out, he did write six Red Sonja novels um, that I thought were pretty good. They're written in the 70s, uh, maybe early 80s. Um, they're kind of hard to get a hold of now. Um, but they're some of the only, um, I mean, they are the only like Red Sonia pastiche novels that are out there um, since she's primarily been a comic book character. And I'd recommend checking them down if you're a Conan fan. That, that they, were co -written, they were co written with David C. Smith. That, that's probably how he got his writing chops to write the Sword and Sorcery Simon of Gita stories. And one of them. I think it's the it's the Star of Evil Omen. It has some title like that. It's the last one. It is a prequel to a Simon of Gita story called Seed of the Star Star. And a prequel to the color out of space. For, for those of you out there listening, this is why Rick is on the show, because he's the only person in the world who knew that. Now you all know it too. <laughs> that and he is the nicest guy on the planet. So No, I think you're nicer. Me? Yes. Did Did you hear that, Ben? I did don't. You hear, ben, did you hear Rick's that? Rick's tired, and Rick you need to stop bullying him and pressuring him before we go. It's just not fair. Look, okay. let me show you how nice I really am. I'm going to let you go next, Ben, with your. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Wait, Mike. Can I? I'm sorry. I, I, no, I'm I, sorry. I, go I, ahead. I, I need to do this while Pete is here. Okay. That's the reason. Shoot. Do okay, it. so I, when you had released this topic, I was like Bridget. I was thinking creepy. And for me, creepy I blame myself. Like, does it make your ooh, does it like ooh, ah, no. does it make your flesh crawl? Because most horror written horror isn't well scary, but it can give you a sense of unease. And then mm -hmm. remember, I'm I've been to autopsies, I've participated at autopsies. Simply describing gory stuff that doesn't really get to me. And so a lot of the real, when I was thinking, what is really, really creepy, actually, Pete, you wrote one of the stories that made my flesh crawl. I was there when you premiered it at Necronomicon reading it. Now, what collection is it in? 
I, I kind of I forgot the name off the top of my head. It's the Randy Campbell tribute. Um, about the guy that, who's is that, is that, does that have Galacki in the title? Yes, Children of Glacky. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. sounds right. So Pete wrote this story about a guy who would really wants to get a hold of this, I don't know, piece of written work, and he's given sort of a. It's not exactly the seven. I don't even know how. To, how do you pronounce it? Geese, gays, geese. Yeah, sometimes uh, seven geese by Clark Ashton Smith. It's kind of like that, except in the modern era, and through the most sordid underbelly, there are things that you wrote, Pete. <laughs> like, oh, please, how is this your mind? Oh my God! Ugh. It's it's It's, funny. it's sort of a sequel to Cold Print in a way. It yes. is. It's, 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 it's brilliant. It was cold print. Oh my God. It, okay. Well, so there's another story like that that did that to me. And that was by Poppy Z. Bright. And it's uh, Are You Loathsome? Oh, are You tonight? Loathsome Tonight? It's in, I think, Children of Cthulhu, the old John Peelan anthology. I don't know if it's in print anywhere else. It's really not cosmic horror at all. It's really not horror at all. It's just the way that the author wrote it about how Elvis died that gets you absolutely, oh my, so uncomfortable. And oh my God, how is this true? Are you, why are you writing this? Oh my God. I hope everybody Another, listening, watching has a pencil and a pad of paper ready today. I, I'm, I'm writing them down on, on Facebook. Uh, so uh, two yep. things. When, when I said I blame myself, I'm really disappointed in all of you that you didn't reply so do i because that's a classic ghostbusters line um so and the second thing is uh, people matt has seen autopsies not because he's an assassin but he is actually a doctor thank for clarifying that yeah i thought it was important <laughs> i've seen autopsies but yeah but but for a different he is also actually has a doctorate so just don't let him try to get away with that comment either (laughs) um just to just so you guys know i actually wrote essays in college classes referencing papers pete wrote in his professional life so don't don't try to play that off that's pretty cool i didn't know that that. is pretty cool i I brought it up on the podcast before i might have not been listening to you it's entirely (laughs) possible so yeah so go on so here here's the deal I wanted to be a doctor. I was planning to be a doctor. You're still a doctor. I, I, I hate people. <laughs> and I discovered that sick people really suck. And I'm not good with dealing with them. <laughs> so. Wow, I'm going to have to rethink our friendship because <laughs> I've been sick since before you've known me. <laughs> yeah, well. Yes, yes like, but you were also like at a distance. Or see, you know, see, I'm oh, different. I, I I love all the poor people and I love all the sick people, and I'm so happy. He, he walks among the common man. <laughs> poor sick people. Oh, I'm so. It's great. Um, anyway, he forgot to wear his brown Franciscan robe today. <laughs> okay, so the other set of stories that made just every single there were like four novellas in this book by Charles Grant. Uh, oh yes, I'm listening. Charles Grant. Uh, what was it? It was um, Nightmare Seasons. It's his complete fiction. The first book. It was four novellas. Uh, That's the one where he's in the he's in the library and it's wintertime and it's raining. Is, are you talking about that? There, there's there's I don't remember. The, there was one like where they're at the post office and the post office. Gets that's attacked. the one. That's that's the one. Yeah. There's there's a, a woman who works at a paper. And her colleagues start vanishing. And uh, it's like every single story in there, because the setting is so mundane, the people are so ordinary, but then he just slowly starts turning the screw and the tension builds up. And I just found uh, that was really a very effective um, increasing tension, just giving me a creepy feeling reading it. You so, don't know, you, Matt, I have to say this. You don't know how, how happy I am that you brought up this book without any me mentioning it or any, anything. First of all, it's available on Kindle for $3.99. It's one of my favorite books. And it's, you know, it's classic Charles Grant in the atmosphere. He, you know, it's so moody. And it starts off with this, this, 
this writer is in the library of the of the small town and he's doing some research and he's not getting anywhere and then the librarian gives him this this book without a title if i remember correctly and says you know take this home and read it and it, it it's just please pick it up i'm talking to anybody watching or listening please pick it up it's and charles grant he's a slow burn but as matt said he's very he can paint some really creepy uneasy scenes and it, I, I just can't say enough about it so okay two more things which is they're both novels mm -hmm. so one is by laird baron the croning yeah we were getting a lot of the croning mentions the thing is you know when you start to get read his work that the, where he was dabbling in the mythos um sort of the mythos it's like he has his own uh, creation old leech and the children of old leech are like ants to this thing and we are ants to them but they like to torture people the very end of this book was completely horrific oh yeah it, it's so such simple prose and it's just absolutely make your flesh crawl horrific but you you've got to earn that sensation by getting through the whole book which is brilliant but at the very end it's like oh my god i can't believe he ended it this way like not only that but there are scenes throughout the book that are just so creepy when don miller's you know near the beginning where he takes his wife out to eat to a restaurant and then he hears something rattling in the trunk so he stops by the side of the highway and it's night, you know, and there's woods all around. And he just, it's one of these moments where, where the fuck did this come from? There, there's this pasty white face that leers at him from the brush. You know, just little things like that. And I think it might be free for Audible subscribers. Um, there was a version of it out there that was free to near free that I remember. Recently. Well, the I will say this: the narrator for, and I'm sure this was not Laird's choice, but the narrator for um, the Croning on Audible was a really poor choice, in my opinion. It's it's the lady; she sounds like she's about 22 years old, and that's just not the right fit. I'm sure she's good with other books, but that's not the right fit for the Croning. So, so, so okay. So the last book I want to share now. This, this one actually scared me the whole thing didn't scare me but i don't know why i was reading balak by stephen mark rainey okay and basically what's going on is th in this town there's child kidnappings that are happening and there's a scene where a woman's friend comes over they're going to have dinner and when the thing happened i actually practically jumped in my chair which has never happened to me reading a book except when I was like 14. I was reading Winged to Death, I think, by Hazel Held, rewritten by Lovecraft, right? Um, about the wasp thing possessing souls. And I was like in my room, hot night in Cincinnati, window open, and a big black wasp flew in the room. Mm. Crawled into the light fixture and vanished, never to be seen again. Joe and Pulver tells a similar story. I can forget which Stephen King book he was reading, me, but. But Balak did that to me in that one particular scene and so i salute you mr rainey oh my gosh that that really actually made me jump he's a patron and another very nice guy mark rainey see mark rainey yeah look up his stuff now um oh before i i because i gotta go in a few minutes but i want to i want to mention that there is an issue of i think it's marvel two and one in which um, Ben Grimm, the thing, is sitting in an easy chair, reading, and you know he's all alone in the Baxter building. He's got a single light over his head, and he's reading Salem's Lot. <laughs> <laughs> and this happens to be when Spider-Man has, I'm oh, sorry, Thanos has defeated the Avengers and is on his way to Earth. And Spider-Man's sense is tingling. And he's like, he Spider-Man sneaks up and just taps Ben Grimm on his shoulder. And he sucks his cigar right inside. That's and, great. Yeah, and so it's just like people recognize that this stuff happens, even 
you know, and I guess that I think that was written by Jim Starlin, who was like, you know, one of my favorite comic book writers. So anyway, I I thought so, I would mention that one. Thank you. So to get back to Matt mentioning Nightmare Seasons, you know, I'm not, not going to let this go for a couple of minutes. It was introduced by Don Damasa. Am I saying his name correctly? His last name? I think so. Uh, all four novellas take place, I'm quoting him now, in Ox Run Station, the imaginary New England town that was the setting for many of Grant's novels and short stories. In this case, uh, each set in a different decade and a different season of the year. Um, skipping forward, here's, 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 I highlighted this. Evil, the horrors here the horrors, excuse me, revealed here break the rules we believe to be absolute. They aren't vampires who can be dispatched by stick or garlic or werewolves filled, fearful of silver. In fact, we never learn much about their nature, their origins, or how they might be defeated. Evil also strikes out at random. Its victims did nothing to deserve their fate. It is the lack of order of cause and effect that is particularly chilling because it means that none of us are safe. And then you have the prologue and he's, he just starts off with winter and rain. Um, and it's, it's just one of my favorite books. So again, that's, uh, Oh, nice Pete. What? He's holding up Charles Grant books. Uh, so he sits down to read the, the book that the librarian gave him. Uh, and so with cigarettes and a not so fine brandy to read, I read it, forgetting the time and the cigarettes and the brandy and the cold, but not forgetting at all that I was still in Ox Run Station and it was winter and it was raining. Like I said, only three ninety nine on Kindle, if you're into Kindle. So uh, who do we have next? Ben? Did you? Yeah, I should go real quick because, like Pete, it turns out I will have to go soon as well. Um, so, Pete mentioned Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. Uh, this is a book that when I read, I was probably about 14, maybe 13. And uh, I it's one of the books I read, like, I just stayed up all night and read the book in one sitting. Um, and at the time, I remember thinking, like, wow, this isn't just like, ooh, this is scary, it's monsters. This is scary, like, everything about this book creeps me out. So it wasn't even just like, oh, these dead pets coming back to life. It's the story about the family, what happens to their son. Um, all of this I found horrifying. And in fact, to the point where as a father now, I can't reread it. Um, it creeps me out too much. Just, just even thinking about what happens to the son um, in, in both cases, uh, is it, it bothers me. Um, and then the other Stephen King book I wanted to mention is Revival, which we've talked about several times, uh, especially because Mike's so abusive. Don't start. And, um, but uh, Mike has mentioned this too, that the ending of Revival really has kind of this existential dread to it. It's, it's hard to explain. It's almost like a reverse Christianity, in my opinion. Like, not a reverse Christianity, like some weird Satanist thing, but the idea of maybe the afterlife is, isn't a good thing and you and you don't want to go there and for anyone it's, for anyone. And that's a spoiler, but if you're watching the show and you haven't read revival, we should just ban you now anyway. So <laughs> that's fine. Um, Some of these people are so glad I read it. I'm going to say it again, <laughs> but this is uh, really that book I think is Stephen King's scariest book. Um, it takes a while to get into it maybe, but once you finish it, it's, it, you're going to have trouble sleeping that night, I promise. I don't care how jaded you are. It's it's really, really, really freaky. And um, at least in my experience with what's scary, that's the kind of stuff I think that really scares me the most. The, the yeah, because it kind of digs stuff. in and it won't let you go for a while. Exactly, right? The torture porn stuff, you can become like like Matt is jaded to this idea of gore and, and horror and things like that. And especially if you've if you've dealt with pain, maybe you've got like, um, some chronic issues like pain doesn't really become like this big fear that maybe it was when you were like 15 but but these kind of existential issues like Mike said I mean those really get in and under your skin and it's hard to it's hard to dismiss them um, so those those are the ones that kind of stand out and, and in a way Pet Cemetery does that to parents 
Um, so if you're a parent, I maybe wouldn't recommend Pet Cemetery, but everyone else should definitely check it out um, if you haven't read it already. And I know these are pop books, so to speak, but um, those are the ones that like, when I think of like, what's the scariest thing I ever read? Those are the two books that, that just jump right out at me. No, books are books. You know, I don't, yeah. Um, and it's a very well-written book, Yeah, Revival. Um, someone just, I just want to say, someone mentioned, Andreas just mentioned uh, Ted Klein's uh, Children of the Kingdom. And uh, yeah, that is, that is, I've said this before on the show, but that's one of my favorite short stories. Maybe it's a novella. I don't remember the word count, but it's in Dark Gods by Ted Klein. Um, and if you haven't read Dark Gods, you really should find a used copy somewhere and do that. It just came out again. It was just re-released. Did it? Yeah. Oh, right. Who did that? I'm not sure. Let me look it up. Okay. There's a PS Publishing version. Yeah, that's probably it. Yeah, maybe I can snag one of those. Uh, mine's getting a little beat up. <laughs> it's one of the originals. Um, who do like we have PS left? Publishing normally does. There's no Kindle version. Ugh. Oh, really? Yeah. Rick? I love... Okay. What uh, I had revival as well for the same reason, so I won't go any more into it. But uh, what Pet Cemetery was for fathers, Ramsey Campbell, The Way of the Worm is for grandfathers. And then it's part of a uh, trilogy that uh, Campbell wrote recently called the Daedalus Trilogy. And it, uh, the, other, the other parts of it are Born in the Dark and the Searching Dead. And the whole trilogy revolves around a cult which worships a great old one. And it's about this guy who fights it during these three stages of his life. Once as a young boy, once as an adult, and once as an old man. And in his elderly age, he discovers that this cult has been joined by not only his son, but his grandson as well. And he is fearful, rightfully, about what's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. And as a recent grandfather, that kind of freaked me out. And I can't reread The Way of the World for that reason. Yeah. Now, my next choice is psychological horror, not supernatural horror. It's Robert Block's The Scarf. Now, I could have included Psycho here instead, but the difference between The Scarf and Psycho is they both deal with serial killers. But Psycho is about a guy who's, in the book, is middle-aged, not young like Anthony Perkins, who runs a motel, who's a serial killer. And I could never be that guy. But in the scarf, they have a guy, a serial killer, is a young, talented guy who becomes a writer, as well as a serial killer. And that kind of freaked me out because there's a heart of darkness in all of us and I could see myself becoming that under the wrong circumstances. So like what Alan Moore said in The Killing Joke, one bad day you can become the Joker. All it takes is one bad day. Yeah. Yeah, one bad day. I gotta go, guys. I'll see you later. Bye, Thanks Pete. for being uh, here. Bye, Pete. That uh, what Rick just said made me think. Like, actually, the scariest book I ever read was nonfiction, and it was Ordinary Men, um, about how people became killers for the Third Reich. Mm. Because, <clears throat> like he said, any of us you could put you could easily see any of us could have been pushed in that direction there's no and, it's scary uh, right i would say with recent circumstances you could see maybe any of members of your family becoming something like a nazi without further comment yeah anything else rick yeah um I have a Garrel and Poe's The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, which I read as a young teenager and got freaked out by the scene with the sailor and the uh, 
seagull, if you remember it, it's sort of like what happens in the lighthouse, the recent movie, if you, if you don't remember it, the scene from the book. It also is the first horror story I read that didn't give you all the answers at the end. And I'm still wondering what the heck was going on in the Antarctic, even though Lovecraft sort of wrote a sequel and Jules Verne sort of wrote a sequel. They never explained to this day what Tekalili means. And that has always shocked me. And perhaps no answer is more frightening than an answer that somebody could give. Yes. Yeah, especially done, done right. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Now I also have F. Paul Wilson's novel, The Sibs, or The Sibs, S-I-B-S, for siblings, which I can best describe as sort of a combination of The Thing on the Doorstep and Robert Block's The Mannequin. Mm. And it's about this weird family, weird things going on with... Uh, the human brain, and it's just scary because it's not too far removed from the real world. I'm never going to get really scared by Cthulhu coming because I don't think Cthulhu exists. But people like this could exist. Right. And my last novel is going to be somewhat weird. It's a novel called Mal. Dora by a Count Lutreamount. And I only know about him because Lovecraft mentioned him in uh, Medusa's Coil. And his novel, which was published in France during the 19th century, was this weird novel about a human who becomes a demon and there's all sorts of weird stuff that I can't even describe. And it's like reading the ramblings of a bad man, but it just stays with you and disturbs you. And I have yet to finish this novel, even though I've had it for three years. Mm -hmm. The problem oh, was Mal Dora. Why haven't you finished it? Oh, I haven't finished it. Because it's just, it's like I feel I'm being driven mad the more I read it. Well, that's awesome. Sort of get that sense from reading the Horla, especially knowing what happened to Guido Massapont later, you know? So. You know, in, in Lovecraft uh, mythos, we always get uh, the book that drives you mad. This reads like one of the, like one of those books should read. Mm. See, like the Necronomicon, everybody that tries to re reproduce a, a version of the Necronomicon fails because it's never what never has the effect on what the readers do with the stories. This has that effect. Any any others? Uh, no, that no, that's about it. All right. <laughs> well, a little sidebar. I want to. Uh, before we go on to Bill, I really appreciate everybody watching today, and I appreciate all the support from the patrons. The there is a lot of extra content for only five bucks a month. I've got the link in the show notes, but if if you don't see it, you can just Google Lovecraft Easy and Patreon, and you get a lot for about the size of a hamburger once a month. So, and I've got a lot of uh, I, I'd say at least half a dozen. Uh, prominent writers that are patrons too so I appreciate appreciate everybody who helps me out and keeps me going so um, thank you very much uh, Bill what scared the hell out of you buddy well um, I, I've got three but the, the first one sort of a, has a story attached to it so I'm about 19 years old and I'm working as a security guard at a coal mine and uh, the way I worked was I came in Friday, I worked 18 hours on, 18 hours off, 18 hours on. So I could get four days in in about three days. So I go to work and this enormous snowstorm comes in and, and traps me there. 
and I can't get any relief. And I've only packed enough food for one day. And I've got to stretch it over, you know, from one meal to about eight meals and water too. Uh, And so the snow just keeps building up and building up and building up. And the only thing that I brought to keep me entertained was The Shining. And so I'm reading. Speaking uh, of snow. (laughs) Exactly. So I'm reading Jack Torrance. I'm reading The Hedge Maze. And there's a scene in The Shining where, you know, they all come and they're, you know, exploring the house. And then this, the big snowstorm comes in and locks them all in. And then it's over. There's no getting out. You're stuck there for you don't know how long. And that sense of dread, I just finished reading that. And I'm in exactly that situation. And so about four o'clock in the morning, I have to go and make one of my rounds. And I get out and the snow's up to my knees, get in this old truck. I'm driving up the mountain. And coal mines are very, very far back away from everything. And so I'm driving miles and miles. It's a dirt road. You can't see the road. It's completely covered in snow. And um, there's no guardrails or anything. So whenever your lights go out over the abyss, you just see nothing. And if the truck breaks down or I wreck or I, 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 I get stuck, nobody's coming after me. And it's miles and miles to walk back. And so mm-hmm. I do my rounds. And I go up to, the, to the, the, the coal mine, the actual coal mine, which is just a notch cut out on the hill. And there's these sodium arc lights that bathe everything in this sort of dead yellow color and these very stark shadows. And there's nobody but me, I hope. So I make my rounds. I come back down the hill. And my last stop is at a thing called the loadout. The loadout is the, is the place where the coal goes up a conveyor and is put down into the coal cars. And there's a a control room there. And so I get out of the truck and I'm going around. And because the snow's so deep, I'm watching my feet so I don't fall. And I get to this bottom of these stairs and I look up and there's this red gore dripping down the steps. Holy shit. It's going drip, drip. It's pulled in the snow at the bottom of the steps. And again, there's this yellow light there that makes everything look Mm. dead. And I thought exactly what you said, Mike. I thought, oh, shit. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to go check this out because w- what if somebody is hurt? I mean, w- what if that is the case? And I, I ran away. So I start up the steps and my feet are in the gore going squish, squish, squish. And I get to the top and I put my hand on the doorknob and the, the door is cracked about three inches. And I put my hand on the knob and it won't open. And I give it a jerk and it has this rending metal sound and all the snow pulls away to let the door fly open. And there at the top of this red gore are these big cans of lubricant that are leaking. Mm. (laughs) And so, you know, this enormous sense of relief. I go back, I'm completely freaked out. You know, I've written the hairs on the back of your neck up. The hairs literally stood up on the back of my neck when, when that happened to me. Mm-hmm. I get in the truck. I go back to the guardhouse. It's eight by eight. I'm still here for days. I don't know how long it's going to be before I get my relief. And the only thing I've got to keep me distracted is the shining. <laughs> and so I finish reading the book. And that is the creepiest experience I've ever had with a book. To this day, it's, it's a formative experience for me. And uh you talk about something that just creeped me out to the bottom of my soul. That that event completely did that. You know, cell phones have changed so much, haven't they? Mm-hmm. Because that experience might have been mitigated at least somewhat if it happened today. You know, it. it you know, I, I, there was a phone, but you know, I was the one thing I was forcing the power never went on, but. Uh, that was that was a that was an uber creepy experience, and I thank Stephen King to the pit of my soul for that. Um, you know how often do you get to have that emotive an experience, uh, and you know you, you you've got to love that. Yeah, uh, I, I have a couple more that are a lot shorter. Sure. Uh, one, this is a book that it's not that scary, and a lot of people bust on Dean Coons. I got my lights down to make it a little bit creepy here, but uh, this is the taking which is my favorite Dean Koontz book. And basically- yeah, That's his uh, Rapture book, isn't it? Basically. No, no, no. This is, this. I, I'm going to tell you about it. This book, um, 
there's people, uh, I think it's in the Pacific Northwest, it starts raining and it becomes this torrential rain and it's happening all over the world. And the, the rain is so heavy and it's got that fog in it that, that you have with rain that you can't really see into it. And these things began to appear in, in the fog and you don't know whether they're animals or not. Uh, they don't look like anything that it's supposed to look like. There's these mushrooms that grow in, in you know, inside the, the rain and stuff that people are stumbling upon. And he never really spells out exactly what's happening. It intimates that, that there's some alien race trying to terraform the earth uh, and, and the, these different things, but you're, you're never completely certain what's going on. And you know, I got the different, if, I, if you don't mind me jumping in, I got a different take from that book. I read it about when it came out about, what, 20 years ago? Yeah. And they were talking, you know, the, some of the characters, they quote things in their sleep, like, uh, he will sift you as we, which is a Bible reference. And the way I saw it, the whole thing was some people were raptured and then other people had to make their way through the quote unquote biblical tribulation that's what well, that's what i got from it what what I, what I got from it was this open-endedness that i wasn't exactly sure what was going on mm -hmm. and to and the reason that I, I besides liking the book the reason that i included is that even today when you have one of those really hard rains with a fog in it and you really can't see into it it takes me back to the feelings that that book gave me uh, of that uncertainty is what is just beyond what I can see. And, and even as an adult, you know, and as you said, it's read that book years and years ago, it still creates that feeling in me whenever it rains like that. And that's just awesome. That, that, that and, a writer and that's an effectively written horror novel. If it's absolutely. Doing that. Speaking and, of Dune I know you've got another one, but I just got to say, you're right. He does get ragged on a lot. I really don't, enjoy his more recent work to he to each his own so that's i'm not saying that with with a, with any judgment but um you know i prefer the older stuff uh he wrote a book called fear nothing uh that that starred a guy in it by the name of christopher snow and um i was listening to it recently and listening, you know, you get an extra dimension that you don't just reading. And especially if you're in bed listening at night, it's two in the morning. And I remember specifically, because I looked it up, the chapter, it was chapter 14 in Fear Nothing. If you're just sitting there listening to the book, it is one of the creepiest chapters I've come across. Um, and I, I just really can't explain why, because it would spoil too much. But, uh, but Dean Koontz has written some great stuff, too. Lightning, there's, there's mm -hmm. several really good books. Lightning was good, yeah. yeah. And the, uh, the, the first of the, the, the Frankenstein, Prodigal Son sort of books were, was, was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else, Bill? For my, my third one is The Exorcist. Because like you, Mike, I, was, I had a very, very religious upbringing. And in my family, that was true stuff. And I wasn't allowed to go see the movie when the movie came out. And it was years later that I got to read the book. And um, I, I, I won't describe it, but th there's a, a scene with a cross, a small cross. Um, and it's other, other scenes in that book that, you know, just because of my very, very conservative religious upbringing, that it just seemed like this was a possibility. And as, as a result of that, that book really stayed with me for a very, very long time. Um, all right. Did I cover everyone? Uh, yeah. For myself? I, I've thought of a couple things since people were talking, though, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind at all. So um, one that came to mind that uh, kind of similar to uh, what Rick was talking about is, uh, it's actually a, a series. So, um, it's like a, a series of a bunch of short books, but it's called Kelly's diary. And 
what was creepy about it is when I was reading it, the kid and the story was the same age as my kid. And it's basically about the zombie apocalypse happening, but it's told from the diary of a seven-year-old. So you're reading it as if you're reading that child's diary. So they're talking about going to school and, oh, now there's less people coming to school and people are getting sick. And like, so you're getting it from that perspective of a seven-year-old. And it is really creepy, especially as a parent to read that and imagine, you know, what, what a huge event like that would be like from a child's perspective. Well, so, yeah, and not not just the zombie apocalypse, right? What we've been going through for the last two years, you know, mm-hmm. my son's a year older than yours, but still, um, and he's very wise for his age. Really, he he truly is, and I'm not saying that because he's probably listening in, but you know, there's nothing like living half a century or more. You've got a lot more life experience under your belt and and what goes on what happened in 2020 it's still very unsettling um but just imagine this happens when you're 16 17 years old or younger Mm -hmm. you know it's just it's very confusing very devastating yeah and like you know one day she's at school and then you know this pretty much goes into chaos and she's thinking well how do i get home to my parents and you know goes from there and there without you know spoilers i can't say much more but just the dealing with people um oh gosh and then uh bill was talking about his story of stephen king and i don't have quite as dramatic of a story but i do remember um if anyone out there has been in the military and has ever sat fire guard duty you know you're sitting in a, a barracks hallway literally watching in case there's a fire so that you can wake people up and uh i was reading desperation by stephen king and i just remember how chilling that was to just sitting there by myself in the dark where you're literally supposed to be watching for stuff to happen and i was reading that it was probably not the best choice <laughs> you know this uh, this all makes me thinking about with what you related what bill related um there's a st- story that joe pulver related about reading a stephen king story and then something happened i can't remember what it was so i can't do it justice but you know it what you're going through at the time can add to that absolutely Uh, ben mentioned revival and i was very sick at the time and i'm not talking about my chronic illness or my back and not being able to walk very well i mean i had the most horrible flu you can think of and this is back about 2015 or so uh, I don't remember sometime soon after the book came out. So I'm, I'm reading the book. I get to the end and I'm feverish and I'm out of it. And I was just hit with the ending of revival. And I got to say in my flu like state, it creeped the hell out of me, you know? And I stayed that way as long as I was sick, a couple more days. Um, so. We, uh, we had, um, uh... Uh, the uh, people who created um, Archive 81 on mm-hmm. for an interview and what's striking about them is they're really young. I don't even know if they're 30, you know, and they were talking about how older pros, one of them was saying it's, it's rather unreadable. But that what was just talking about got me to thinking the, pr- probably the most unnerving prose in a short story is by Algernon Blackwood, it's the Willows. Mm-hmm. Right, yes. Willows. Yes, I read that like as recently as two years ago, and it just oh, it's still even. You know, I don't argue with that anymore. It was when a young person says that, especially, I just sort of let it go because it's not. They they're just in a different generation. You can't explain it to them. You know, you can't make them like it. So why do, even discuss it? it when you come right down to it, it is a matter of preference. It is subjective. But, uh, you know, they mentioned that they didn't like uh, Lovecraft, which, okay, fair enough. I don't like Thomas Jefferson. He was a rapist and kept slaves. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm with you guys. And then they were like, well, we don't like the, uh, we don't like his work either. I'm like, you know what? You have every right to your opinion. Uh, but I didn't agree on that one. Well, I've heard people say, you know, like the thing in the doorstep is 
one of my favorite stories. And of course, the first line is, you know, I, I tell you, I did not kill my best friend. And it's a great first line. It is. It's amazing. And people will say, oh, I mean, that's so cliche. Well, the reason it's cliche is because Lovecraft wrote it. Um, people yes. thought, wow, how effective was that? I think I'm going to write something like that, too. <laughs> and yeah. he, got, he got that line from a fellow Weird Tales writer, Kirk Mashburn, who wrote a story called The Broken Thread. There you go. Which is, it's a little different. It's, it starts off. I put five bullets in the, you know, it's, it's something like I killed my best friend. Yeah. Three times or something like that. So when you're looking back at older prose, as you say, you know, um, it's important to remember they don't have the hundreds of years of experience that we have that of, of writing and, and things that have happened old. since then. Sake. It's like, <laughs> I, I know I look it, but I'm not that old. Come on. <laughs> You well, like, you know, somebody has a guilty conscience because I wasn't talking about you, Matt. <laughs> you can like Arthur Conan Doyle and Dashiell Hammett, too, mm -hmm. is my response to that. Well, let me get out some of my scariest uh, slash creepiest. Uh, people have already mentioned a couple of them. When I read Pen Pal, and if you haven't read Pen Pal, I highly recommend that you don't read up about it don't even read the back cover jacket or what it's about or the, the synopsis on Amazon or whatever, just read it. Um, it's one of the scariest, creepiest books I've ever read. I really applaud the author. Uh, Who wrote it, Mike? Dathan Arabach, if I'm saying his last name right. He wrote a book called, also called Bad Man, um, which was kind of a doorstopper. That came out a year or two ago and was interesting, but I thought a little bloated and, and wasn't anything that Pen Pal was. But it was it's still worth a read. Don't get me wrong. It's miles above a lot of other stuff. Um, but if you compare it to Pen Pal, it's not there. Well, what uh, and of course, uh, D-A-T-H-A-N. D-A-T-H-A-N. Yeah, just... Just Google pen pal author. Pen pal is one word. And and you'll find it. And uh, again, do yourself a favor if you haven't read it and don't don't read up anything about it. Just just sit down with it. Uh, people have mentioned the cro the croning by a friend Laird Baron. Um, and I, I could not agree more. And it's not just the end, it's it's scenes all the way throughout the book. It's just this sense of impending dread and what the hell is going on. Uh, the Secret of Ventriloquism by John Paget is one of the most unsettling books I've ever read. Um, seriously, if you haven't read that one, you you really should pick it up. Um, I read a book six to 12 months ago called The Shadows by Alex North. And uh, it's it's very, very unsettling, very creepy and scary in many parts of the book uh i'll throw out again i you know a lot of times i'll i'll read a book on kindle and i'll listen to the book on audio at the same time like if i'm reading the book during the day and i want to keep reading it when i go to bed i'll put on the audio book version um and they you know they do that whisper sync thing and there are some scenes in there that i heard on audio just laying there in the dark that were just downright insanely creepy. Uh, I just thought Alex North did a really good job on it. Um, and I've already mentioned the fear of nothing by Dean Koontz, uh, that chapter 14, of course you have to read to get to chapter 14. So you have context and uh, he does, his characters do get a little judgmental at times. But I like the character of Christopher Snow and his friend Bobby and his girlfriend, um, uh, Sasha, I think it is. Uh, so it, it's one of those, he wrote it in 98, 99. And it's, it's definitely worth mm -hmm. picking up. So uh, I will go down the list as so that we don't run out of time, try to do this not too slowly. But on the Lovecraft Easing group slash message board on, on Facebook, I asked people this question, creepiest novels you've ever read. Uh, okay, so our friend and 
boss, Mike DeBronzo, said Mother of Stone by John Langan, Snuff Movie by Michael Menace. Uh, yeah, that's one of the creepiest short stories I've ever read. Mm. DeBronzo's uh, absolutely right. Um, I just uh, published volume one, uh, put out a bunch of, uh, of the author's stories, and it's called Rules for Monsters by Michael Menace. And it's available in print and in Kindle. So uh, pick that up. You're going to get a lot of stories for um, very little. If I had to pick one short story in the modern era or semi-modern era that was the creepiest that I've ever read, it would be Snuff, Snuff Movie by Michael Menace. And you can find it in that book. Uh, Alter by Philip Fricasse. The One That Got Away by Katie Webster. Uh, and he mentions the croning and any number sh of short stories by Laird Barron and it by King. Athena Barnes says out of the outa into the outa by Alan Dean Foster. Um, the, uh, Todd Sanders mentions the willows, which we've talked about. Um, Mark Bennett says ghost story by Peter Straub. It's a good one. Yeah. Very good. Very good book. Um, let's see, Mark Thibodeau, Mark, I hope I'm saying your last name right, 20 Days of Turin by Giorgio DeMauro, and you guys feel free to pipe in if you've read these and want to comment. Uh, Seth Popham says, agrees with me about The Secret of Ventriloquism, he says, The Secret of Ventriloquism by John Padgett really had me feeling ill with the case of the creeps. Uh, and he's the second person to mention Cypher by Kathy Koja. And then House of Leaves uh, made me feel like some someone breathing over my shoulder. And I could not look back without inviting supernatural assault. John Nelson, the croning. Uh, Laird, I don't know if you're, you're listening later, but you're getting a lot of mentions. Uh, George Ibarra says Song of Callie by Simmons. That is a very creepy novel. Have you guys read that? I, I read that for the first time about four years ago. Uh, Karen Ballinger says those of Jack Ketchum, there is something in his work that chills me to the bone. Um, also Blood Meridian by Cormac, Cormac McCarthy didn't even finish it. I'm doing this because I just didn't want it to be just our opinions. Um, I know that you guys listening out there have massive tbrs to be read lists and it is our job to make those even more massive so um david plow mentions pen pal thanks dave uh here's another croning mention gemma files has mentioned some creepy slow burn tales stephen smith says and uh, Jeffrey Thomas agrees and says her experiment, experimental film is very creepy indeed, which I 100% I agree with. Um, I don't know who this guy is. Matthew Carpenter. You mentioned it already. Are you lo loathsome tonight by po Poppy Z. Bright? Uh, another House of Leaves mention. Curtis Lawson says The Drowning Girl by Caitlin Kiernan. Uh, Chelsea Goodwin replies, one of the best novels I've ever read. Um, and Tim Evans replies, also Caitlin Kiernan's The Red Tree. Todd Stanfeld, The Troop by Nick Cutter properly cut me, uh, creaked me out. David Her Dave Herring says, Straub's Floating Dragon and parts of his Blue Rose trilogy still give me goosebumps. Uh, Logan Noble with another croning uh, mention. Uh, Loton Cagle, Fred Chapel's Dagon. Here's another pen pal mention. And then Derek Austin Johnson says, I haven't read Ted Klein's The Ceremonies in a long time, but it remains one of the creepiest novels I've ever read. Stuart Onan's A Prayer for the Dying also has some unsettling moments. Creepy novels of a more in, uh, recent vintage include The Grip of It by Jock Jump. 
I'm probably mispronouncing that author's name. I'm thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reed and The Missing by Sarah Langan. So there you go. Lots of lo lots of books to add to your TBR pile, folks. Uh, anything to add to all that, guys? It's a great list, that's for sure. Well, we're going to add to it some more because I... <laughs> I, uh, I got this in the mail from Tor Nightfire. Thank you, guys. Um, this is Nothing But Black and Teeth by Cassandra Kaw. And now we're into the shout-out section. Um, this was published in 2021, so, so it counts. Um, here's one. Um, that looks really good to me. And it's it's by, it's coming in March, I believe. It's called, And In Her Smile, The World by Rebecca, uh, Rebecca J. Allred and Gordon B. White. Um, what if the world you thought you knew was a lie older than God? As children, Jeffrey and Serena each caught a glimpse behind the veil of the everyday, a hidden cult guarded by women with the power to change reality. A myth kept quiet by a watcher with the strength to unmake the universe. A darkness smiling behind rows of teeth without, without end. Although Jeffrey and Serena have only just met, their lives have centered around the mystery of the quiet woman. Haunted by their knowledge and driven by a desire to change the minds and souls of those who enforce the rules, they're willing to sacrifice anything, including themselves. Um, it's it looks very cosmic horror. I, I'm just seeing some Gnosticism in it. I've not read it yet, but Rebecca sent me the uh, the well, article. That is great today. Jack, jacket copy. That, that's some of the best jacket copy I, I believe I've ever I've ever heard. That's that just makes you want to just grab it right now. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> you know, two minutes later, I was emailing Rebecca saying where can i get the art from so uh what do we got next we got next uh laurel hightower i think a lot of her she's just uh, briefly been noticed on the scene with the book called uh crossroads it's a novella if you haven't read it you really should it's a, it's really a gut punch uh and then she's got a book coming out soon um called below Below by Laura Hightower with cover art by Trevor Henderson, who we've had on the show a couple of times. And Trevor's really um, uh, found a lot of success lately, and it's well-deserved. Uh, it looks like this is some sort of Mothman uh, book, you would think, by the cover. And then if you read the synopsis, while driving through the mountains of West Virginia during a late night snowstorm, a recently divorced woman experiences bizarre electrical problems, leaving her with little choice but to place her trust in a charismatic truck driver. But when an unexplainable creature with haunting red eyes gets between them, she is forced to make one of the toughest decisions of her life. Will she abandon the stranger that kept her safe or will she climb down below where reality has shape shifted into a living nightmare? So that's coming out in a month or two, I, I believe. So, uh, so far, you really can't go wrong by reading a Laurel um, Hightower book. Um, yeah, the Mothman is uh, from not too far from where I grew up in West Virginia. Um, let's see here. All right, some more shout outs. And this is from my Twitter followers. Phil Jones says the best horror of the year, volume 12. Nathan Ballingrud's The Butcher's Tale was so original. Uh, now I'm reading his book, Wounds, and I'm loving it. Uh, Andrea says, Seth by Christy. Now, remember all these I requested either published in 2021 or 2022. So Seth by Christy Aldridge, like discovering a forgotten 70s gem. Pray Lied Eve 3. Hope I have that title right. Linda Peaver. Images that conjure up a feeling of dread. The Witch is the Body by Farrah Rose Smith, one of the finest stylists of the weird. 
and Ghost City Girl by Simon Paul Wilson, a unique blend of horror and sci-fi. Stephen Ward says, Come With Me by Ronald Malfi is the best novel that I've read in 2021. It is very good. Um, Zach says, Gordon B. White, Rookfield, ACY is the ghost sentences, excuse me, the ghost sequences, and Kurt Fowler, we are happy, we are doomed. Let's see how many I have for here. Don't want to keep, I don't want to bore everybody. Uh, Robert Atone has a book coming up out this year from Raven Tell. It's called The Triangle, and it's the first in the Rise trilogy. Um, Rebecca J. Allred, um, and in her smile, the world, that's the one I was talking about a, a, a few minutes ago. It's coming Friday, February 11th. So if you want to read something fairly quickly, um, I think that's it. I mentioned nothing but black and teeth. And if I missed anybody, email me lovecrafteasying at gmail.com and we'll try to give you a shout out in a future future episode of course don't forget the veil of the white horse by scott thomas um i'm reading where all, all is night and starless the weird fiction of john linwood grant and it's really good um catriona ward who i interviewed a few weeks back the last house on Need needless street I don't know if any of you have gotten to this yet. It was just her and I in the interview, but um, she's got a book called Sundial that's coming out this year. And you really should check that out. Um, they're sending me an arc, I think, and I haven't had a chance to read it, but The Last House on Needless Street was just great. So I can't read the re wait to read this one. Uh, and I got to say that I am enjoying so much this gift from my wife and son, the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. Um, they gave me this. It's a little hardcover. Um, and it, it's about, for those who don't know, it's about words that the author made up, John Koenig, for, for feelings and situations that we really don't have have words for like here's a here's a particular favorite this isn't the kind of book that you read from beginning to end you kind of find something that interests you and then you read and then you read some more uh, onism means the awareness of how little of the world you'll experience um i won't read this whole thing but you get to it's strange how little of the world you actually get to see no matter where on earth you happen to be standing, the horizon you see in the distance is only ever about three miles away from you, a bit less than five kilometers, which means that in, at any given time, you're barely more than an hour's walk from a completely different world. Um, without calibrating your perspective to the breadth of all possible options, you have no way of knowing. You'll always have to wonder. Still, most of the time, you manage to keep your focus on the bright circle of your immediate experience while your brain gets to work building a mental picture of everything that you might be missing. Sometimes late at night, you might look out at the lights flickering in the distance. I, I do this. this. This is why this book appeals to me so much. Just on the edge of the horizon and find yourself struggling to imagine the alternate universe that each of them represents. You think of all the places you'll never have time to explore, some of which might feel like the home you've never had, or like a living hell, or like walking around on another planet. You might one day be able to visit one or two or ten of these places, but you'll never be able to shake the feeling that with every step you take, a thousand more lights will appear, and a thousand more, and a thousand more. Uh, I, I really recommend this book. So um anything else guys yeah i got a book to recommend all right uh ralph grasso recommended this book to me it's uh the rim of morning by william sloan oh yeah 
He was a writer in the 30s. Who um, he, he wrote two cosmic horror novels, To Walk the Night and The Edge of Running Water. Right. I got them both right here. They, uh, by Stephen King. It was an introduction by Stephen King. And uh, The Edge of Running Water was made into a movie with Boris Karloff called The Devil's Command. It's about a scientist who's trying to create a machine to communicate with the dead. And uh, the To Walk the Night has a slight similarity to Beyond the Wall of Sleep by Lovecraft. That's all I'm going to say. All right. Matt, Bridget, anybody else? Bill? No, that's all good stuff. It's great to hear about stories. And think about all these, these writers who've reached across time and space and touched every one of us and left a mark on us. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what this is really about. Yeah. And yeah. Um, just, just that, that hand reaching across time and touching you and then your hand reaching across time uh, as, a, as a writer, that's what I'm trying to do. And, and it, it just, it's amazing. And the thing that makes prose so important is that it's the only medium in which you bring something to the table. That author is, is writing their story, but just like you and I were talking about, you know, getting the taking, having a different, you know, thing that we brought away from it. That, that's because we added to that story ourselves as we read it. And nobody has the same experience when they read a book because they bring part of themselves to it. And that's the magic of prose. I heard it described once as a, a person coding in into a typewriter or a computer or, or whatever in a room by themselves and then Three years later, later, 50 years later, 100 years later, somebody else is sitting down in a room by themselves, decoding it, reading it, in other words. So, um, and, and there were so many writers who were failures during their lives who were now giants. Poe, yeah. oh, for instance, yeah. Uh, last but not least, and this is thanks to Bridget. Um, Creepy, uh, this is at tour.com. Uh, the best niche genre, oh, creepy books about fucked up films that fuck people up. So there's a, there's a headline for you. Uh, I think it was, this article was inspired by Archive 81, but they give some recommendations. House of Leaves, uh, for one. Last Days by Adam Neville. I'm, I'm pretty fascinated in the, not so much the found footage, but uh, Archive 81 really appealed to me because, y you know, you've got these past experiences on tape and you've got, is there a story there? Is there not a story there? Um, Gemma Files experimental film, for example. Um, I'll read the synopsis. We can't talk about novels about creepy films without mentioning this fantastic spooky novel. Files is both the reigning monarch of this subgenre, as well as the author solely responsible for convincing me that the entire Canadian independent film chemistry, uh, community is haunted or cursed or both. In experimental film, a film historian begins looking into the origin of a film she sees in snippets at a screening, which leads her to dig into the life and disappearance of a trailblazing Canadian woman filmmaker who will also happen to be more than a little interested in folk tales and spiritualism. This is a wonderful example of a story in which the film itself is an active participant in the horror, starting with the sly detail that silver nitrate reels are literally dangerous, i.e. highly flammable. This is just the stor shortest story that I really like. Uh, I read Night Film a while back. I really enjoyed that. I don't know if you got got to that one yet or not, um, Bridget. But but uh, yeah, this sort of subgenre really interests me. Subgenre. 
It really interests me. Mike DeBronzo says there's a second season of Chapel Wait coming. What do we think of that? The end what of the first the season was so poetic, but I'm curious to see where they go. I want to see the world. Mm-hmm. I second that. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to mention, Rick, Matt, Bridget, anybody, Bill? I've got an obscure thing. Sure. There, um, there's a publishing house called DMR Books, which comes out with uh, pulp style anthologies. They have one called Planetary Adventures, which has a short story from the 1950s written by a writer named Bryce Walton called Man of Two Worlds. It's got a surprise appearance by Conan and Miss Mary, who is clearly Robert E. Howard's hero, no pretense. Uh, it's a supporting role, but it's a pivotal role. So this is an unauthorized usage of Conan the Barbarian in the early 50s. Planetary Adventures is the anthology. Here's one I missed, and I know it's a Netflix movie, but I'm going to read the book. Um, looks like it came out in uh, 2013. It's called A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. Have any of you read this? Uh, at seven minutes past midnight, 13-year-old Connor wakes to find a monster outside his bedroom window. But it isn't the monster Connor's been expecting. He's been expecting the one from his nightmares. The nightmare he's had nearly every night since her, his mother started her treatments. The monster in his backyard is different. It's ancient and wild, and it wants something from Connor, something terrible and dangerous. It wants the truth. From the final idea of award-winning author Sibidin Dowd, whose premature death from cancer prevented her from writing it herself, Patrick Ness has spun a haunting and darkly funny novel mm -hmm. of mischief, loss, and monsters, both real and and imagined now I'll, I'll say this and it's not because i'm so great it's just because of the plat I've, I've got a big platform and I, I get sent a lot of books and my point in saying that you get sent a lot of review books to review and, and they're all free i'm gonna buy this book because it i missed out on it somehow and it looks so interesting to me so i can't thoroughly recommend it since i haven't read it yet but i'm it looks like my kind of book. So again, it's called A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, N-E-S-S. -S. So I wanted to throw that out there. So anything else, guys? Hey, Dave, thanks for the tip. Dave tipped me in the YouTube uh, live chat. Appreciate it, Dave. Prize, Matt? Yes, remember, The Monster Hunters. It's three novels in one, military, horror, sci-fi, stuffish. Um, send an email to ezineprizes at gmail.com and put monster in the subject heading. We draw a winner about six weeks from now, so those of you who are listening on the podcast uh, in your car or something, uh, you still have a chance. Uh, we interviewed... Uh... Matt Carden a few weeks ago and I had to do some extra work. His volume was a little low, so I'm trying to even everything out on that. But I plan on having that out Monday or Tuesday in audio. It's on YouTube, of course, for um, for those who listen uh, on the go. So thanks for your patience with that. Um, and I think that's it. I hope everybody had a good time. I hope all the I hope the audience had a good time and uh, feel free to email me and let me know if you did. Lovecraft Ezine, Ezeam, which is not the prize email. What's the prize email again, Matt? Um, Ezine prizes at gmail.com. So, so I hope we've given you a lot of scary books to, uh, to check out and uh, maybe some more recommendations of what's coming out this year and what just recently came out last year. So, so anyway, thanks everyone. And, we will see everyone uh, next week. We're going to have a, a really good 
Patreon podcast on Thursday um, with six very good writers. It's going to be a great conversation. So, so Matt, I know you have to go cook for the family, so I'll, I'll let you go. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here. Really appreciate it. And we will talk to you soon. Hi everyone. Night.